everyone, and thank you for joining today's webinar. I'm happy to be joined by our PPM sponsor from our 2023 conference, SAP Signavio. Before we jump in, I'd like to do a brief round of introductions. I'm Maddie Lundquist, the Process and Performance Management Principal Research Lead for APQC. Joining me on the call today, we have Jim Sullivan, who's the Global Head of Product Management for Sustainability at SAP. Jim believes that the strongest value chains of the future will be those that are regenerative, circular, as well as inclusive. We also have Jose, who is a Chief Product Strategist in the Value Acceleration Delivery Team at SAP Signavio, where he oversees strategic and thought leadership programs. One of his uh, prior to his current role, Jose led the SAP Autism at Work, an award-winning human capital management transformation program that he'll talk a little bit more about later in the webinar. Also with us today, we have Alessandro, a senior development manager at AP, SAP Signavio. He's passionate about value frameworks, business transformations, change management, process optimizations, KPIs, and data benchmarking. Let's look at our agenda for today. First, we'll start by discussing sustainability from the strategic perspective, and then move into providing real examples towards the end of the webinar. I'm super excited to have the SAP team with us or the SAP Signavio team with us today. But before we jump in, we have a quick poll for you guys. So you should see a poll jump up on your screen. Go ahead and answer those questions. And while you guys are answering those questions, I do wanna let everyone know that if you are just getting started with sustainability, I have a couple of resources that APQC has in our resource library, and I'm gonna share those in the chat here in just a minute. But one is around APQC's definition of sustainability as well, as well as some additional resources you can find. And then getting started with sustainability is an article we have, which are two great places to start. How are those poll results looking? Awesome. I think with that, I'm going to hand it off to Alessandro. All right. Thank you, Medi, and welcome to everyone also from my side. Um, let me move to the next slide. All right. Maybe um, a short background around this uh, strategic part that I'm going to introduce to you. Um, First of all, we are part of some Subsignavia family and SAP. So we merge together basically the product experience, uh, the, the consulting um, experience from our uh, transformation project, as well as our uh, SAP Signavio background from uh, business process management. Uh, while doing our um, transformation project, we learned that um, data is very important for our customers, but, but uh, always it's also uh, important to have um, a top-down approach on what we call and we refer to as uh, strategic objectives. Um, this is a kind of a framework that we have established as a value accelerator for Subsignavio uh, that is touching on few pillars from a strategic point of view and is connecting the dots from a strategy point of view, business goals, business processes, KPI, business metrics, and benchmark, as well as capabilities. So this is a kind of connecting the dots uh, from the very top of the strategy and uh, the process uh, operational performance and a capabilities point of view. So this is connecting a little bit uh, the dots into these uh, kind of uh, entities. And a few examples of strategic objectives that we are actually referring to in our framework are related to um, basically six point of view. The first one is expand and grow. With expand and grow, basically we are referring to every processes and, uh, and KPIs and metrics related to uh, basically the top line and improving the sales cycles. Um, the second one is related to the improved operational excellence. Of course, here we are uh, referring to the uh, how to make your processes more effective, looking at the metrics at the KPIs for automation, for uh, error handling, and so on and so forth. Um, the fourth one is improve experience. Uh, yeah, we are looking at the experience from um, our customers, from um, employees and suppliers uh, during the journey um, connecting the different stakeholders together. And then we have uh, minimize risk and compliance. 
Um, of course, this is now related still to the process point of view, but looking from a different perspective, different angle, um, related, of course, to the key risk indicators and compliance perspectives. Um, the other point that, and the other strategic objective that we have also listed here, of course, on top of the sustainability, which will be our topic for today, is related to optimize capital effectiveness. And here, let me maybe um, share also with you um, as a quick reminder, this is a topic that we have already touched during um, the latest APQC conference, where um, uh, I'm glad also to share with you a couple of uh, assets that we delivered during that time. Uh, and in case you have not been attending the conference, uh, feel free to use the QR code to get access to this. So with that, I would like to hand over to, to Jim to listen uh, about the why and what of sustainability. Great, thanks uh, so much, Alessandro. If you can uh, click one more slide, Jose. Um, I really wanted to start at a, uh, at a fairly uh, high level. As Alessandro said, uh, it really is a fairly broad topic. There's a lot of business drivers. So I wanted to add a little bit of a view of sustainability within the business uh, process context. So I think, People may be familiar with uh, the concept of kind of a three-legged stool or people, planet, and profit or social, environmental, and governance and keeping those in balance. And my message today is really it's it's an interesting way to think about it, but it's much more like a nested model as we as business people are operating within the bounds that society sets and society is operating in planetary boundaries. And when we begin bumping up against planetary boundaries, such as the uh, the climate crisis or uh, ocean plastic crisis or deforestation or any of a number of these, uh, society reacts in pretty predictable ways towards business. So uh, you have regulators uh, begin to add additional regulation. We're in a phase right now where uh, regulations are increasing at an unprecedented rate. Uh, you have customers spending uh, towards their their values and wanting to do business with uh, companies that share those values. You have investors uh, moving uh, uh, their investments around between sectors, between uh, companies, and you have employees uh, that want to work uh, for companies that share their values uh, at all. So really, key message for this is sustainability is not a nice to have. It's not an also uh, have, but it really needs to be embedded in core business because these drivers are in response to megatrends and uh, they will only uh, continue. So back to you, Alessandro. Thank you, Jim. Um, let me take now um, some thoughts around business process management and sustainability, right? So many um, Many customers and also people around in the in the organization are mainly looking or primarily looking at a reporting perspective on sustainability, right? So very often that is taken as um, um, kind of compliance and reporting that company needs to really uh, have the data uh, to be shown for uh, for the stock market and also for their brand reputation and, and so on and so forth. But of course, once you have your data in, in your reporting and you have all the, your uh, drivers and KPIs calculated, um, then the question is, how can you get better? How can you really improve? And that is where uh, basically business process management will take really the leading roles. Of course, this is the most important part when you are really looking for a change. Um, for business process management perspective, there has been a lot of literature around that. So here I've taken um, a small example for, for a BPM model that is called the green BPM model, where you can also look at a kind of a readiness for your organization, looking at different um, dimensions like the governance, the modeling, the monitoring, uh, the strategy, the attitude, and optimization. Of course, this is these are all elements that are a key uh, to be infused into the DNA of your organization. And then on the other side, uh, we are talking about data, right? So uh, the data is uh, our primary elements to really optimize and uh, improve your, your, your performance. So here you can see that uh, our business process management can really uh, set the foundation for uh, putting this data into a context that you can understand 
and find uh, exactly where uh, basically um, the transparency with the data can be um, uh, shared with uh, with uh, with your management. Um, the insights can also be uh, derived from there, and you can really build a feedback loop and improvement. So these two elements together can really make your um, the difference for your uh, business process uh, and sustainability perspective. So with that, um, back to you, Jim. Great, thanks uh, so much, Alessandro. If you can uh, jump sure. one more slide ahead, awesome. Uh, so I'm now gonna put a bit into uh, context around SAP and how we're viewing the topic and working uh, with customers around this. So as you can see from the slide, there's really four uh, focus areas or key pillars that we look at around embedding sustainability in the business process. Uh, one of those is around zero emissions. I'd mentioned climate change is an important topic, and that's really focused on uh, energy transition uh, and areas uh, to improve there. Uh, there's a pillar around zero waste or circular economy, and this is really around materials transition. How do we keep uh, materials and products in use for the longest possible time at their highest possible value? And then a key pillar uh, around zero inequality uh, which is really around the people uh, transition. Uh, all of these are kind of overpinned by this holistic steering and reporting uh, topic where a, a way that we put the uh, strategy together uh, to execution uh, within the enterprise and then is underpinned by a lot of the uh, business processes and uh, uh, solutions uh, in, in those places as well. So this is not something that uh, SAP developed out of a, uh, out of a vacuum. Uh, I think 100 out of 100 customers I talk to have uh, very similar or the same uh, key pillars that they focus on. So it's a fairly uh, large topic. And if you go to the next uh, slide, Jose, I don't want to go into too much detail around products or solutions. But what I do want to say as a takeaway is that each one of these use cases for these topics has a very different uh, key business process underpinning it. It has different uh, personas that would need to operate within the end-to-end -end process to do that. And the other thing that becomes vitally important is there's not always one answer. There become a variety of trade-offs between cost, between embodied emissions, between uh, social topics such as fair wages in the uh, supply chain. So any uh, solution around sustainability really needs to go into depth around these personas, around the process change needed, uh, but also the trade-offs among uh, all of that. So as we take a look uh, at the overall topic, uh, it's really about embedding uh, sustainability into the overall business process. It's looking at the process uh, from an ERP perspective, uh, transforming the data, uh, based on some of these topic areas and then embedding it back into the uh, into the core process where people can make uh, decisions on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis. So um, as you'll see for the rest of the uh, session, uh, we'll spend a little bit of time diving in uh, in a, a bit more depth around each of those uh, three uh, key pillars. So I'd like to turn it over to uh, Maddie now for a, a brief view. Um, around how sustainability and the business process fit together. Yeah, thanks, Jim. And as Jim mentioned, there are three pillars. So they're going to look at zero inequality, zero waste, and zero emissions. But before we jump into that, I want to come back and tie that to APQC's terminology for sustainability. Since our research does span the entire enterprise, we look at sustainability that same way from a very comprehensive view. And our definition of sustainability does include environment, people, social, governance, management, and financial practices. But looking specifically at those three pillars that SAP Signavio is about to jump into, I want to tie them each to the different research APQC has. So when you're looking at zero emissions, that's going to relate to APQC's supply chain and logistics research that we've created. For example, do supply chains actually screen their providers for emissions data for, for one example? Looking at zero waste, that would relate to our process management research. So what process measures do organizations use? How do they define their processes? And our seven tenants of process management fits into there as well. And last but not least, the zero inequality pillar that Jim mentioned will relate to our DEI or our diversity, equity, and inclusion research that our HCM area creates. 
Additionally, we're in the process of updating the process classification framework to include, include sustainability as well. So now that I've tied the dots between APQC's research and SAP Signavia's um, terminology, I want to pass it back to Jim to dive into each one a little bit more. Awesome. Thanks uh, so much, Maddie. So uh, we'll start with uh, zero emissions. I think uh, climate change is on the top of mind for a lot of folks, especially in the uh, U.S. this week, where we've hit some uh, fairly record-breaking uh, temperatures across most of the uh, companies. So as I look into uh, where the data might reside, how uh, a lot of this would affect the business process, one thing uh, I do want to mention is that uh, data foundation is kind of the key topic around any of the uh, sustainability topics and how many companies are starting is with uh, aggregated data or average data, um, even spend-based data. So there are some data sets out there that show if I spend uh, X amount of money on uh, you know, sugar or steel, whatever commodity I'm buying, you can look at embodied emissions uh, within those commodities. So the good news about that is it can get you to a a uh, high level view of hotspots and know where you would want to focus your energies. The downside to that level of analysis is you really can't show action over time. Uh, the only way you can act in the business process is to uh, reduce spend if you're using a spend based factor. So that's not really a good outcome uh, from a business uh, perspective. So over time, what we're finding is many, many companies moving from these industry averages towards more actual data and using a uh, transactional uh, uh, data foundation in order, to, uh, in order to do that. So over time, it's beginning to uh, sync this transactional data with the embodied carbon data, along with financials, along with procurement, along with uh, operations at every level of the, uh, the business process. So again, key message is the more granular the data, the more actionable it becomes within the uh, process. If you go to the next slide, uh, Alessandro and I are going to share a, a bit of a deep dive uh, example, and this is something we uh, had put together taking a look at the auto sector. So I think uh, folks are fairly familiar with electrification of vehicles. If you look at the uh, embedded carbon uh, within a vehicle, traditionally it's the use phase, uh, driving around, uh, burning gasoline, having emissions come out the tailpipe. Uh, which becomes the part of the process that uh, people would most want to focus on. Uh, with electrification, with battery uh, electric vehicles, what we're finding is there's now uh, no emissions in the, uh, in the use phase. So we need to look at embodied emissions. Where's the electricity coming from? What are the materials within the, uh, within the automobile? Uh, so this is a bit of example to, uh, to go uh, take a look with into a deep dive within the processes within uh, automotive. So if you go to the next slide, please. Jose, what we would start with is the um, strategic uh, process for the end to end. So this is taking a look at uh, corporate level uh, goal setting. Um, no reason to, uh, to know the details here, but for greenhouse gas emissions, they're typically measured in uh, direct emissions, otherwise called scope one, indirect emissions from electricity, a uh, use called scope two or scope three, and typically companies have these strategic level goals on uh, reducing emissions in line with uh, latest science across uh, across that. So if we drill in uh, one uh, screen deeper, if we take the strategic emissions, uh, we now look at the, uh, the business process and material flows. So this is taking a look at an organizational uh, footprint from the uh, purchased goods where it might be rolled steel, it might be the engines or the interiors, uh, and then uh, also taking a look at uh, CO2 uh, downstream and uh, embodied emissions within sold goods. So this might be our vehicle that we're uh, manufacturing. If we take uh, one more drill in uh, deeper, looking upstream at purchase goods, what we can see here is, uh, as Maddie said, uh, one of the first things we want to look at is embedded emissions uh, from our suppliers, from the materials uh, we're purchasing. And you can see here, uh, an example of uh, one factor uh, uh, for CO2e, which is based on secondary materials in a database, as we begin to change our business process a bit, engage with suppliers and get uh, additional more granular data, uh, we can see that uh, we can begin to differentiate within these rolled sheet offerings, uh, you know, based on the embedded emissions or embodied emissions uh, per uh, 
uh, different offerings. So that becomes one way within the process that we can uh, we can begin to change is work with our suppliers for direct data, uh, look at the purchase process, and look at the uh, embedded emissions within uh, uh, differenti differentiating the materials we're purchasing. If you go one more uh, step ahead, uh, we're now into the uh, production process, and this is some data from our uh, ERP system goods receipt from suppliers, where we can begin to see. Uh, the amount of materials we're using uh, from particular suppliers. So now that we map up uh, the embodied emissions from the different types of materials we're using with the materials in the production process, we can begin to create this bottoms up very granular uh, view into emissions. If you go one more uh, screen, Jose, we can now see a Sankey diagram or a flow diagram of the steel uh, coming into the production process, moving through production process, and moving to production of body parts. If you go uh, one more uh, level deeper, you can see then how the production of body parts uh, rolls up to the overall automobile manufacturing. You can click once more, uh, Jose, for me. Thanks. Uh, you can see now the greener painted car body coming together with the interior, the electronics, the chassis, uh, the engine, and uh, what you can see from a business process perspective is all of the embodied emissions from the purchased goods, from the materials, and from the manufacturing process adding up uh, at every point of uh, the production process to get to the output of our, uh, our uh, greener or our lower carbon uh, cars. So that's really how things uh, begin to roll up, how they can be added up from a, uh, from a bottoms up and granular level. Now, how do we begin to get to the interesting part, activity to change uh, within the production process. If you go one more slide, this is an example now of how uh, this material can begin to flow in a uh, productive uh, circle within the business process. We know the embodied carbon, we can now go within a purchase requisition uh, back to our suppliers and we have the normal financial uh, implications of uh, which supplier, the quantity, the valuation price, total value, but we now have embodied uh, CO2 emissions along with that, where we can uh, begin to uh, work in a cycle of continuous improvement with the supplier. So that's uh, one way we can begin to embed. If you go one more slide, we can also begin to embed uh, within the financial. Uh, process. So this is a uh, sheet of an upcoming preview of what we're calling the green ledger, where you can see cost of goods sold, along with debits and credits, including the environmental information and carbon line items, along with every uh, financial line item for a uh, for profit center, for the other ways uh, that we would uh, take a look at a journal entry around uh, managing our business. And finally, when we have all that data at that granularity, uh, we can roll it up, and if you go to the last uh, slide from me, uh, Jose, thank you, uh, we can begin to look at uh, what-if scenarios uh, planning, where we look at the financial implications margin, along with the embedded greenhouse gas information, and that uh, can begin to give us some really good business data back to that strategic level we started with. If I were to uh, increase my percentage of these greener vehicles by 20%, what effect would that have on uh, supplier costs on operational costs and overall margin for the vehicles. So wanted to do a deeper dive there and just walk through at a, a fairly granular level uh, the process by which uh, we would take a look at uh, those embodied carbon emissions. And Alessandro, then over to you to take a uh, deeper look at some of the personas and uh, and and processes. All right. So thank you. So we just heard from Jim about the real case uh, uh, involving zero emission for automotive organization. Uh, what we learn is that um, all these processes, all this data that we have seen are really um, across the different line of businesses and it's really across the different processes. So here you can see, for example, uh, it's impacting for sure the governance, the finance, um, the, the, um, the, the source to pay, the plan to fulfill all, all the production element. But let me give you a little bit more uh, in-depth examples of um, how the processes could be really relevant in transforming your sustainability journey, right? So we have seen that um, the very uh, first point uh, is, of course, in setting your strategic goal, setting your strategic target. Um, so we refer in this case to our governance uh, process uh, framework. 
This is where, of course, um, eventually the sustainability officer uh, might be interested in uh, uh, defining exactly the goals, the KPI based on the strategy. Of course, you need to align with your corporate strategy to really understand where you want to, uh, to get for, for your sustainability um, um, targets. And also, you will need to prioritize sustainability initiatives, leveraging the data-led insights, as well as uh, having a comprehensive um, uh, monitoring of all the, uh, of all the uh, KPIs related to that. So we are referring here to, of course, uh, the governance part of the processes. And very important is always to look at uh, two other dimensions into the processes, uh, um, which are related to the value drivers, of course, uh, for example, what are really uh, the value that this process can re really bring to, uh, to your organization, like uh, in this case could be uh, reducing the carbon footprint or reducing the emission cost, and also some process metrics that uh, you might want to leverage really to un understand in your process chain, in your value chain, where to um, eventually change some of the steps in your process. Maybe you need to re redefine maybe you change your your model uh, maybe you need to do a transformation right so for example the adoption rate of sustainability policies might be uh, an element you might want to look into the different process years in the different line of businesses uh, you might want to monitor to the time to calculate all the sustainability kpis this is also a very important factor uh, to to, uh, to enable your organization really to shift and change along the way um, this is just one example, but we have seen that um, many other actors in the organization are really um, crucial and important for uh, the success of your sustainability initiative, right? Uh, we have seen the indirect. So uh, Jim was referring, for example, to the um, to the L3, uh, the, the scope three uh, element in the uh, sustainability uh, emissions. And of course, this is the indirect um, uh, part. Of course, everything related to your uh, sourcing and procurement uh, processes. And here, of course, our procurement officer um, is looking for procuring raw materials with uh, um, sustain sustainable suppliers. And of course, he wants also to reduce the spend. And um, of course, um, he has also in target the scope three mission to responsible sourcing. So he has a very crucial role in trying to find uh, the best source from, um, uh, from everything possible. Uh, still keeping, of course, the, produ the production cycle and the warehouse uh, um, fit and ready for, for production. And uh, on the other side, also, it might need to change its processes because, of course, it might need to adopt different criteria while doing the sourcing, different uh, prioritization, and um, therefore the source to pay process and uh, certifying and validate suppliers is the business activity where it might need to look um, for a different way of doing things. There are also uh, very important value drivers also in this part. Of course, you might want to reduce the compliance and risk management costs, um, reducing costs with circular economy and, lo uh, and local sourcing, for example, uh, increase supply diversity, increase uh, green packaging uh, adoption rates. So these are few value drivers which might really bring a value uh, to the organization uh, by, uh, by executing uh, a more sustainable uh, procurement process. Uh, also, some process metrics that you might want to monitor along the processes might be the percentage of conformance to procurement policies, a supplier diversity a rate, a percentage in using of renewable materials, and, and so on and so forth. We are not done, right? So it's not only the procurement officer that is uh, important and relevant. We have seen in the automotive example that, of course, uh, production uh, is um, is the key, right, for uh, for the emission of the CO2 and, uh, and, and carbon emission, right? So the plan manager now, yes, also the, the target of uh, improving sustainability performance in the production through continuous improvement. Um, it might look for streamlining the processes by transitioning to a cleaner full fuel and uh, optimized transportation logistics as well as enabling regular predictive maintenance, right? Uh, you might want to monitor the, the CO2 emission uh, along the production cycle. And in case you are uh, reaching the tier sold, intervene with some uh, predictive maintenance so to, um, uh, to, to fix the problems. 
Um, in this case, of course, we are looking at several processes in the plant to fulfill. Um, we, we are looking at the monitoring and optimizing manufacturing processes, of course, but also the transportation part might be uh, very relevant to uh, and connected to this part, because, of course, you might want also to optimize your transportation costs, reducing all the CO2 emissions. Uh, value drivers also here, um, of course, reducing transportation costs and reduce uh, the cost of, of goods sold. Um, are very um, very relevant for your organization, as well as the metrics that you might want to measure during your processes, like the raw material utilization rates, the number of maintenance cycles to reduce the emissions, uh, the, the freight capacity utilization, as well as the average annual transportation cost per carriers. We have seen that the last step in the process flow that uh, Jim has just mentioned before is of course the finance, right? All these elements are getting um, uh, finalized into your uh, balance sheet, into your uh, final um, uh, reporting numbers that the finance manager has to provide to, uh, to the external audience and, and to the external stakeholders um, to uh, to comply, of course, with the regulation, but as well as to uh, also to uh, to show and increase your reputation in the market uh, to show how the uh, organization uh, is complying with sustainability and environmental targets. Uh, of course, the finance manager is trying to accomplish the ESG reporting compliance, is driving the sustainable investment portfolio. So it's very important that he gives the, the right priority, the right importance to, uh, to the investments that are done in the organization, that he understands how this can also be a cost reduction as well as, uh, as an increase in the top line. And uh, of course, he will need also to align with the sustainable development goals. Yeah, we are looking at uh, financial processes in the record to report area, uh, performing the financial accounting, of course, is our business activities where um, our process model might need to include some additional steps, some different steps also uh, to include all this element together. Uh, value drivers, of course, very important as well. Um, of course, we want to improve the regulatory compliance we might want to increase the return on sustainability investment, also uh, trying to understand that this is not just an extra cost, but it's really an opportunity for the organization also to, um, to get uh, an higher return on investment and, of course, increase the cost efficiency. Yeah, During the process, um, of course, we want also to monitor a lead time to close the ESG reporting, alignment with sustainability framework, uh, percentage of payments for sustainable projects. All these metrics are relevant to understand your maturity level in the, uh, in the finance processes and to understand whether uh, you are um, on the good side, on the good track for, uh, for your sustainability reporting. So these are a um, few processes. Of course, uh, processes will vary according to the industry you are acting on, to the um, to the type of business model you are uh, you have implemented, but these are, of course, really spread around the different uh, processes and line of businesses. So with that, I'm getting back to uh, to Jim to listen a little bit more about uh, the zero waste target. Great, thanks uh, so much, Alessandro. We uh, will accelerate a little bit. We wanted to give a deeper dive into uh, climate and emissions uh, side, but. Also want to introduce maybe a bit of uh, a different concept of circular economy. And Jose, if you go to the next slide, please. Um, people might question why, what's the, uh, what's the business value? We've been spending the past hundreds of years working on optimizing these linear processes uh, in a take, make, and dispose economy. And if we begin to look at uh, circularity within the business process, uh, one thing that becomes interesting is we cycle less than 9% of all the hundreds of billions of tons of materials we use each year. So this becomes not only a uh, environmental opportunity to avoid greenhouse gas emissions, to avoid biodiversity loss, to avoid uh, the 8 million tons of plastic waste entering the ocean every year, and uh, uh, many of that entering our bodies on, a, uh, on an annual 
uh, basis, but it becomes a business opportunity. Um, so my old uh, agency, uh, EPA, had put some studies out. There's uh, 40 to 800 times more gold in a ton of uh, circuit boards than there is out of a ton of uh, new ore coming out of the ground, 30 to 40 times more copper available there. So as we begin to look at these opportunities for, uh, for urban mining uh, or for uh, maintaining or creating value in uh, materials, it becomes a huge opportunity. If you go to the next slide, Jose, um, there's a group out there uh, called Ellen MacArthur Foundation that's really worked uh, to create the principles for a business process change uh, into operations around circular economies. So the first one uh, becomes pretty straightforward. Uh, eliminate waste and pollution. Uh, anytime we're wasting uh, materials or materials are going into the wrong place at the wrong time, uh, we're losing value that we've spent all that time extracting materials, adding value, creating uh, that if they're lost. And in fact, we're creating negative value if they go uh, somewhere into the environment or into the ocean where they don't belong. Uh, and then need to uh, to work on the, the cleanup side. The second part is around economic opportunity, circulating products and materials, uh, but also uh, enhancing value or maintaining value through the various uh, loops. And then finally, uh, regenerating uh, natural uh, systems as we look at uh, renewable energy, as we look at uh, renewable materials and how do I maintain that. Uh, one more slide, please. So, this is a business process change, both at the material flow levels, as we had talked about for, uh, for climate, but also at the strategic level um, as a company. You can begin to manage this around uh, what are the overall circular inputs into the production processes? What are the circular uh, outputs? How much post-use waste is recovered for uh, upcycling? What's the operational waste uh, from our, our processes? And then uh, beginning to look at overall uh, improvements, things like uh, circular revenues. And there's a whole set of uh, enabler uh, KPIs around uh, this. So um, many uh, frameworks uh, beginning to be uh, put into place around how to look at business health and operations around this. Uh, this is uh, one uh, way to begin to look at that. And if you go one more slide, I wanted to give maybe a double uh, click into how SAP begins to uh, view circular economy in the white space around this. So uh, we look at a framework of monitoring, uh, measuring, and acting on this. And as I said at the very beginning, uh, what we're finding is a number of uh, regulations are coming into place around these topics, extended producer responsibility, uh, plastic taxes, uh, taxes around waste handling. There's a number of frameworks uh, that I'd mentioned, and then companies are making a number of uh, commitments around this. So uh, we just talked about some of the KPIs and operational measures, looking at inflows, uh, things like renewable content, um, outflows, uh, things like circulated uh, products, or maybe uh, product as a, uh, as a service, um, and then looking at things like operational waste and circular uh, revenues. And then finally, we get into the, the business process changes in the exciting area, uh, how do we act to embed circularity into the core processes? So not surprisingly, like uh, within the climate pillar, circular sourcing uh, becomes a uh, highly relevant uh, part of the process uh, operations and limiting waste within that uh, design for circularity uh, becomes a vital uh, topic. And then new business models that could be uh, supported uh, through this slightly different uh, look into the uh, processes. So again, I don't want to spend too much time on the slide, but as we look at a framework, it becomes, you know, what are the topics we're reacting to, the KPIs and the ways we can improve the process, and then ways we can integrate these processes, embed circular thinking within uh, within the end-to-end -end processes. So back to you, uh, Alessandro. Thank you, Jim. So um, we already heard about uh, Ellen MacArthur Foundation. I wanted to share with you just uh, this little uh, graph around uh, the circular economy and the circular processes. Of course, uh, when talking about the zero waste, uh, one of the most important part for uh, the business process management is really try to understand how to change from a linear mindset, a linear process mindset into a more circular 
uh, process mindset. So here you can see in this um, um, in this view from uh, from Ellen MacArthur that uh, uh, basically uh, she's trying to make uh, there is a split between the the technical and biological uh, raw material. So while um, the technical, of course, are all the elements, the raw material that you could um, um, extend the life uh, by doing uh, extra maintenance, or you could basically reuse or redistribute, or you might want to refurbish. So these are all the technical elements and think about in, uh, in the example that we had before related to the automotive industry, you can think about any uh, spare parts of the uh, of the uh, vehicle, like the, the engine or any part of it, um, which of, co uh, of course you are spending a lot of time and money and gas emission to, to produce. And uh, whenever you need to produce as new, you are basically losing the value that uh, uh, you have generated before. By, uh, by just reusing or changing or fixing or refurbishing this engine, you are keeping the value as uh, as the maximum that you can really um, uh, afford, and uh, also keeping the environment uh, and uh, and the waste uh, under control. Uh, of course, this is also very relevant for um, any organization. And um, of course, we talk about uh, the, the the manufacturing part before, and also looking here at the processes related to uh, to the manufacturing, the the purchase manager, the, the warehouse manager uh, needs to really to look on how to maximize the resource efficiencies throughout the product life cycle, really to contribute to a more sustainable and regenerative economy. Uh, it really needs to reduce the waste in inventory and production uh, through data insights and uh, really trying to um, even design the, the parts uh, at the very beginning so that they are really um, um, meant for a, a circular economy. Uh, of course, this is uh, bringing a lot of value uh, to the organization like value drivers, right? Um, reducing the waste generation cost or, all the waste are a very high cost for any organization. So the more you can really reduce that, you are really uh, saving a lot of money. Uh, you can mitigate and answer the production responsibility. And then, of course, in the, in, the, in the process perspective, you might want to really to monitor some process metrics like the percentage of process conformance to waste reduction, uh, the waste diversion rate, as well as uh, the waste recycle, reuse, and renewable rate. These are all elements that you can measure into your processes. Of course, you might need to adjust your processes accordingly. So with that, uh, let me now end over uh, to, to Jose to hear about uh, the zero inequality. So now we are shifting a little bit towards the, uh, the people, um, more related topic. Uh, over to you, Jose. Thank you very much, Alessandro. Thank you, Jim, and thank you, Maddie. This is a great to be here with you guys today. So for this topic, what we're gonna be doing today is take a slightly different approach. We're gonna look at the topic from a practitioner perspective. And I have one example that I would like to cover. As Maddie indicated, in years past, I was responsible for the Autism Network program, uh, something that we're extremely proud of. And I think it embodies a lot of the traits that Jim and, and Alessandro were highlighting before. So without further ado, maybe a quick introduction into zero inequality. I don't think that these are extremely foreign to you guys. Um, zero inequality is about human rights, health and well-being, diversity and inclusion, corporate social responsibility. Where we look at things uh, from a running a supply, a responsible supply chain and ethical use of artificial intelligence to the well-being of our employees, those folks that are in assembly lines, all the way to people that are information workers. Uh, and we look at things that range from uh, providing empathy and care all the way to uh, prioritizing mental health and well-being. Uh, a cornerstone, I think, of this zero inequality topic is diversity and inclusion, and where we try to empower people to run at their best. Uh, but I think there's a very interesting angle intersection here, which is a corporate social responsibility that ties all of these things together, accelerating uh, business, building future skills. And really leaving a footprint of our companies behind and having a real impact in the communities where we operate. So for, for today's example, again, what I what I mentioned earlier is, is the SAP Autism at Work program. 
So allow me to share a little bit of background around the program. The program came into being in 2013. It was announced at Sapphire, our largest uh, worldwide customer event. So we made a, a commitment to launch a, this aspirational objective to have 1% of our workforce represented by people on the autism spectrum. Uh, this was uh, done for, for a couple of reasons. The first one is that if we look at the unemployment rate for folks on the spectrum, it stands about at around 85%, even though approximately 60% of the people on the spectrum have the cognitive abilities to, to gain and sustain a job. On the other side, we looked at the continuous need for talent. We were trying to satisfy the need for talent for SAP, bringing in different perspectives to our creative processes, including the autistic neurodivergent perspective. Why is this important? Well, as Alan Kay once said, a different perspective is worth 80 IQ points. And for problems, solving the next generation of problems that we have in front of us, we need to bring uh, all the different minds and all the different mindsets. But there's a dichotomy here. On the one side, you have an unemployment rate of 85% in a particular group of people. On the other side, we have an unemployment rate of 3.4%. The question is, why do we have this gap? And I think that the answer is very simple. We have not been able to create sustainable processes that would allow for people to participate in the labor market in an equal fashion. So if we look at, again, one of the key the challenges that we have really, in my opinion, is based on standardization uh, of processes that meet everybody's uh, uh, personalities in, 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 in beings. So I found this, this interesting article some years back in which the author of the article states that failure to make eye contact can alienate hiring managers. One of the key challenges that folks on the autism spectrum have is, is not the ability to look at somebody in the eye. And that can be for a variety of different reasons. I read very interesting research that stated that we can make approximately 10,000 facial expressions with the muscles that we have in our face. And for people on the autism spectrum, that can be very, very distracting because a lot of people on the spectrum are very focused on detail. So it throws people off when they are having an interview. That's just one example in the very, very initial phases of recruit to retire, which is on their sourcing screening part of the employment experience. So many people are not able to go and participate because of these challenges. But I can tell you something, we run this program called Autism at Work, and if we would have followed this protocol with these folks, I can tell you that we would have missed on a significant amount of benefit, including patents and innovations that were created by our autistic colleagues at SAP. So if we look at uh, the footprint of the program, today the program is located in 16 countries. We currently employ about 230 employees. Over the life of the program, we have provided approximately 600 opportunities ranging from internships to high, high school educational programs to uh, full-time, part-time uh, employment, as well as contracting opportunities. And when we started the program, we, we, we ran with it with the idea that we would hire colleagues on the autism spectrum because of their attention to detail in the area of software testing. But very quickly, we realized because we got thousands of resumes of people that are on the autism spectrum looking for a job, that it was going to be completely unfair to take people that were, because they were autistic, to place them in a function like, like software testing. So very quickly, the program expanded. Today, we have 29 roles. Every board area, every division of the company is represented from the office of the CEO to our consulting organization. We have skills that are ranging in, in, in the exact sciences all the way to process orientation. And we have made the necessary process enhancements in the organization to be able to source and screen colleagues on the spectrum in a more friendly way to tra train them uh, as well as well as training their teams. The onboarding process has been also modified and the retention processes have been fortified with what we call a support circle. One very interesting aspect of this is over the years, we, we've shared the program with more than 1,000 organizations, uh, including the United Nations, the World Economic Forum, U.S. Congress. But also we have shared the program with... Uh, High schools, educational institutions, nonprofit organizations, 
we created what is called the Autism Network Summit, expanded it to a number of countries. And the program has been covered by more than 2,300 editorials in the past. Oftentimes I get the question, what is the value? Where is the value? What is the benefit? And I think that we can safely say that it is in four different areas in products and human capital management, in customers and partner and relationships, as well as in social and purpose. So we have here examples, for example, in innovation, where we have had colleagues on the autism spectrum who have filed for patents on behalf of SAP. We have been able to attract great talent, people that have expressed interest in coming to, to join SAP because of these types of programs, right? We have been able to retain uh, also uh, uh, individuals, uh, employees in the company. So we have a great track record in that space. Then we move to employee engagement. This is an area that I think is very, very interesting. A few years ago at SAP, we ran a research project where we came to the conclusion that for every 1% increase of employee engagement, it has an impact of $48 million in the bottom line at the end of the year. That is a very significant metric. These types of programs that allow us to bring the fabric of the company together to pull for something that is meaningful is of extreme importance for us. We've been able to establish better relationships with our customers, connecting with customers and partners in a non-transactional way. We've had more than 900 conversations with customers. There's a number of companies out there that are launching programs as well. Community impact uh, has been uh, also very, very uh, prevalent here. And we have established also uh, partnerships with government in trying to amplify and get these programs expanded uh, as well. Um, I am going to move. I think that we have a, 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 a few more uh, slides to cover, but I'm going to accelerate the pace here for you. What I can tell you is that in the innovation space, one of our colleagues uh, on, on, on the autism spectrum was the winner of the most prestigious innovation award in our company in, in 2019, being actually the first person to win the, the award. It's called the Hassel Plattner Founders Award. Um, he uh, created a uh, technology solution that allowed us to accelerate the process uh, from two days to about 25 minutes, having global impact on how we operate in our finance department in the organization. We have so many stories to tell, so many good things to say about the program. But again, these are these are value creation buckets that we have in the in the organization. If we look at um, at, at this intersectional value creation that we see here at the bottom, I think that the next big question for us is going to be uh, how do how do they come into being? I can give you an example of a hackathon that we did with Dell where we had about 200 employees participate in this hackathon. So it had elements of innovation, of attraction, retention, of employee engagement, customer and partner participation, of course, uh, community impact. We uh, had a, a number of government officials involved in this process as well. But I think the single most important is the, the impact that it had on, on lives because the outcome of this uh, uh, hackathon uh, was to benefit the nonprofit organization that could amplify this, this uh, opportunities for people, employment opportunity for people in the autism spectrum. But I think it's important also to recognize that all of these activities map to a particular process in the organization. And I think that if we look at circling back to what Alessandro introduced at the very beginning, where we have strategic objectives, this process is this KPIs, this metrics also feed into our strategic objectives as, as well. I can think of improving experience. Uh, of course, you know, employee experience is, is a, a partner and customer experience, of course, is of utmost importance. So we have a way to touch on that. What about minimizing risk and improving compliance and responsiveness? We have countries out there in which if we don't have enough uh, hires uh, with disabilities, the country will will get fined. The the I'm sorry, the the company will get fined. Of course, this is without saying that we have an improvement of sustainability. But in the end, if we have less turnover rates, okay, and we're able to manage our capital better and waste, I think that that can also have an impact on optimizing capital effectiveness. 
so what I think is important as, um, as we uh, wrap up here is to recognize that there needs to be stronger uh, instrumentation in order to be able to track, to record, to report, and to improve these types of activities in these processes. Because I believe that we have done this in a fairly opportunistic way up to now. But I think that if we bring some enterprise and process rigor, as the one that was uh, mentioned earlier by, by Alessandro in, in by, by Jim, uh, we can uh, identify, create, and document and report significant value that is also available through the zero inequality space. So I'm going to go to, to our next uh, slide and just a quick wrap up uh, before we go. Uh, Talon, if you, can, if you can launch this survey, that would be fabulous. And here we are going to ask, how would you rate your company's maturity in terms of embedding sustainability in your business processes? Um, whether you are, you are mature, where you consistently do it across all processes, where it is sporadic, or whether you're just starting. And the second question is, just for our own interest, is what area do you think is most of most interest uh, to you? So we'll, we'll spend a couple of uh, minutes on this. Let us know talent when we have gathered enough, enough feedback to show some of the results. Perfect. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I think that we have uh, good information in, in here. I really, really appreciate the, the feedback. And uh, I know that we are a bit uh, short on time, but um, Maddie, I'm going to bring it back to you to see if you want to say some parting thoughts. Perhaps we can organize a Q&A session in the future with our attendees. Yes, that sounds great. Thanks again, Jose, Jim, and Alessandro for presenting on today's webinar. We um, are about out of time, so we're going to let you guys get back to your work day, but I did want to remind you guys that you will get a copy of the slides and the recording via email within a few days. And don't forget to check out APQC's event calendar for more upcoming webinars, roundtables, etc. And just a reminder that if there are any questions, please don't feel um, or don't hesitate to reach out and we'll get those answered via email or a write up. So again, thank you everyone for joining the webinar today. Thank you for our presenters and thanks again, SAP Signavio for sponsoring our 2023 conference. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks all. Bye.